All right, good morning. It is Thursday, and this is House General um, Housing and Military Affairs. And we are here this morning on H232. We had an introduction to this bill by uh, Representative Sims of Craftsbury several weeks ago. And I wanted to bring David Hall in to do a, um, a walkthrough of it as preparation for hearing witnesses next week on this bill. And um, if you've looked at it, you'll know that the bill is proposes to promote land and home ownership and economic opportunity for Vermonters who historically suffer discrimination or unequal access to benefits and services, including black, indigenous, and people of color, and to prepare for climate change, um, which is a theme of bills that we, we have several bills with the same themes in our committee. So um, I wanted to bring David in. David, welcome back. Um, and now for something completely different. Um, thank you again for our, your work on 157. I know it's not done for you, but um, uh, if you could take us through H232, that would be great. And then after David's walkthrough, at 11, we have um, representatives from uh, VHCB coming in because this does discuss um, elements of their mission statement in statute as well as the makeup of their board. So um, David, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. Long time no see. Hope you guys have been well since we were last together. It's been a while. I can, uh, I can share my screen if you want and take you through this. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. Yes, please. All right. Um, so H232, David Hall, Legislative Council. H-232 is an act relating to promoting land and home ownership and economic opportunity. Um, I will say to ground you in uh, sort of where we are in the world of Vermont statutes, this really deals with uh, VHCB, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Um, and makes changes to you know, how it allocates its funding, uh, the composition of its board, uh, some of its practices and considerations when it's fulfilling its mission. So I'm glad to hear you'll have them coming in to talk about you know, what they do and who they are, uh, because I think you'll need to understand clearly you know, what the status quo is and then how this bill would affect that and the extent to which it would affect that. So um, there are findings uh, in purpose um, in section one. Uh, let, before I even look at the words, let me um, let me sort of frame issues around uh, state action and um, you know the allocation of benefits and services to citizens. And I, I want to bring this up because I know you're looking at a, a handful of bills that propose to do things that, that in some cases focus on communities that have suffered discrimination or unequal access, unequal access to benefits. Um, sometimes that is also couched in terms of uh, racial identification. And um, it's, a, it's a thorny uh, area of public policy and the law because like most things, it runs along a spectrum, right? Where uh, 
there are times when race matters or gender matters or gender identity or any of those various classes, uh, you know, uh, disability status, citizenship status. I mean, we have we have laws at the federal and state level that protect people on those bases, for instance, Public Accommodations Act or uh, you know, fair housing laws, those types of things are protective against discrimination on those bases. Um, on the other end of the spectrum are you know, not protections against negatives, but rather affirmative practices to promote uh, advancement or, or uh, the prosperity of populations on certain bases. And when you get to the very far end of that spectrum, and you, there is a line where, you know, you cross over into setting aside, requiring benefits, on, specifically on the basis of race or gender or similar factors, where you start to run into um, the other side of equal protection problems. So equal protection, of course, you know, into the federal constitution, but also we have different manifestations of it in our Vermont Constitution, but the you know basic premise is that you know uh, for the most part, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, uh, government action should be uh, blind to race, gender, other things. There are times when it matters. There are times when it's uh, permissible, but. Um, when you again, when you cross a line over into we're only going to give this certain benefit to this class of people based on race or gender, most of the time um, you are looking at a potential equal protection problem. And uh, the state, in that case, state action requires a compelling government interest that is narrowly tailored to address a specific problem and the burden is on the state to demonstrate why that particular solution addresses that particular problem and is basically the only way you can do it. So this bill, I, I'm not telling you that because this bill uh, specifically raises any specific equal protection concerns at this point, the way that it's written, I don't think that it does. But I am telling you this because in the context of this discussion about the BIPOC community or uh, you know other classes where we're going to start calling out classes of Vermonters for benefits and services, there, there is a line that you want to be mindful of. And the other reason I raise it now at this point in our discussion is because, as I said, uh, you know, if there is a legal challenge, again, the state bears the burden of demonstrating why it is acting and the way that it is acting is substantiated. And findings and purpose um, can assist in that process, um, you know, to the extent committees take testimony and make findings and build a record to support the action that they're taking and can draw a line from findings to action, then that obviously uh, serves to substantiate state action. Ultimately, if there is a legal challenge to any laws that you guys pass and there's a constitutional claim, it's up to a court to decide uh, whether or not what you've done is permissible. And you know it will be up to the attorney general's office in all likelihood to, to argue the state's case and. It will have to build its own record, make its own claim, but findings that you include in bills sometimes can serve to bolster the state's position because it's the, you know, it's the basis of your action. So that's a little bit broader than this bill, I recognize, but uh, in the context of a series of bills and also of proposals that are percolating this session, I wanted to give you that background. So with that, David, I appreciate. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because I think that this, and we'll we'll need to hear it again and again. Is 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 that there is a line here um, that we have to be mindful of, 
and I appreciate you taking the time to explain it. Again, our committee doesn't um, often deal with findings like this, but the findings that are here in this bill and in 273 are pretty extensive. And what I'm hearing from you is that this is that they lay a foundation for in, if we we're to move forward, they lay a foundation for to, to inform people in the future of what our intent is and why we why we chose to work this way if we if we choose to move this forward. Yes. Um, um, let can, me add one. Okay. I'm sorry, did you? No, I was about to go to Representative Kalaki, but go ahead, please. Well, let me just finish this prologue by saying that the the states the states have police powers, which is a very, very broad authority given by the people to promote and protect the public health, safety, welfare, morals, and well-being of society. And those powers, that power is limited only by the constitution of that state, but also the federal constitution. So that is the tension that we always face when the legislature acts. The legislature can do, can adopt any law it wants to, uh, that it believes promotes the public welfare. And then if there is a check on that, it is somebody challenging the constitutionality of that law uh, grounded either in the state's constitution or some provision, some specific provision of the federal constitution. So again, the uh, equal protection clause is really, of the federal constitution is really the sort of the check on these types of issues. But I want to, to stress that the state does have very broad power to promote the general welfare and the actions that you take are presumptively constitutional and remain so until a court determines otherwise. I'll stop there. Okay, a uh, couple of questions. Representative Kalaki in the trial. Thank you. And thank you, David. And uh, welcome back, buddy. Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday, and when we were listening to S39, uh, which is the Senate bill, and there was a section taken out about the, um, let me, uh, for the home ownership uh, revolving loan fund uh, from that bill, and there was a set aside for 25% for the BIPOC community. And as I understood, the administration was kind of walking back from that 25% set aside saying that they're, they got a lot of pushback about the, the constitutionality of that, to, to, to put it like that. So is that different than this kind of d direction? Is, there, is, is this a constitutional issue that will be tested in, in the current bill, not, not yesterday's bill? And sure. this is what we're looking at now. Um, so I, you know, I, I would say that that provision of that bill is is sort of the bright line. I mean, that okay. is a that is a reservation of a, a set amount of benefit for a specific population based on race, which is that's if you're going to have a, a problem or a, a potential for a successful challenge, then that probably represents the, a clear. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna. I can't. I can't okay. tell you whether it's constitutional or not. But I'm. I'm saying that's the kind of uh, framework that would be potentially problematic. I know we haven't jumped into this bill yet specifically, um, but it, it it does not go that far. It doesn't specifically reserve anything for anybody. It you know there's a difference between demarcating funds specifically based on race and by contrast considering things in the grand scheme of how you're going to implement programs um, considering factors like has this community historically not received as much benefit should we take that into consideration um, okay when we're allocating funds great appreciate that thanks sure Representative Trump. Yes, I was going exactly where Representative Kalaki just went. So uh, my uh, question is answered. Thank you. So let me let me say too in that context that th this this bill 
in contrast to the section of the bill yesterday you referenced, this bill um, doesn't always speak in terms of race. You know, sometimes it talks about communities that have suffered uh, discrimination or unequal access to benefits on various bases. And, um, you know, that's a tension as well. Do, does it dilute what you're trying to accomplish by broadening the scope of the assistance? Um, but think about it, you know, rather than saying we're going to give benefits specifically based on somebody's race, it, it's which could be problematic. It you can broaden it and say, you know, uh, income status or you know, proficiency with the English language or things like that, things that aren't race specific, but are maybe uh, socioeconomic specific or, or demographic specific that have overlaps with racial or gender or, 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 or immigration categories, but aren't specific in those ways. Um, those are possible approaches. And this bill does that a little bit, you saw in the statement of purpose. But at any rate, I, I think I'll stop uh, there and just we can quickly walk through this. So you'll see that the, this bill looks longer than it is. There's a lot of unchanged statutory material in it. So the 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 findings here, there's there's only four in this bill that equal opportunity foundational to democracy, but it's not uh, you know accessible to everybody. Under A2, Vermont lands are the historic and current territories of the Western Abenaki people. Stewardship of these lands was removed from the Abenakis. Europeans made Vermont a state in 1791. Three, Vermont has one of the highest home ownership gaps between black and white residents in the country. It was 72% of white households and just 21% of black households owning their homes. And four, the state has a responsibility to recognize and work to redress inequities in its policies and programs that serve as barriers to equal opportunity. So based on those findings, the purposes of this act are to support VHCB in expanding pathways and opportunities for Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination or unequal access to benefits and services, including BIPOC Vermonters to access land and home ownership, support the education and capacity of other organizations seeking to do the same, and to enhance the board's work in land use planning and conservation to address climate change. So it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting that this bill uh, has these dual purposes of sort of addressing racial, racial or, or other wealth disparities among Vermonters, but also climate change. I, I, I find that, uh, I point that out because, you know, VHCB has itself has this dual purpose of preserving open space, natural space, uh, conserving land for recreation and other purposes, but also affordable housing. So it's okay for things to, uh, you know, appear juxtaposed in that way. Um, funny that it's in the context of VHCB. The next series of sections are in, again, the Title 10, the chapter dealing with VHCB. So You've created this organization and this trust fund and statute. You've designated it as uh, one of the primary entities for managing funds for housing and also for conservation. And uh, so these definitions relate to the board and to the conservation trust fund, which are established in statute. You'll see the eligible activity. So what does it do? It's any activity that will carry out either or both of the dual purposes of creating affordable housing and conserving and protecting important Vermont lands, including activities that will encourage or assist. We have A, this is the housing component, preservation, rehabilitation, or development of residential dwelling units that are affordable. So right now, either to lower income Vermonters, to if it's owner-occupied housing for Vermonters whose income is less than or equal to 120% of AMI based on statistics. And then this new addition on page four, again, this is under the affordable housing category. Three, Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination or unequal, unequal access to benefits and services, including black, indigenous, and people of color. So the way this is constructed, remember, we're talking about the eligible activities of VHCB, and we're saying in 3A 
that preserving, rehabilitating, and developing affordable housing is one of the eligible activities that they do. And affordable means to lower income Vermonters, the owner occupied specific, or to now, as proposed, Vermonters who've uh, suffered discrimination. So they have other eligible activities as well that are all in existing law, you know, retention of ag land, wildlife habitat, historic preservation, outdoor recreation, uh, multi-use lands, surface waters, um, et cetera. So that is the change there in the eligible activity. Um, and it's talking about, you know, making housing affordable to these populations that have discovered, uh, suffered discrimination. Lower income, by the way, is a uh, defined term there. And it's uh, equal or below AMI. Um, so that's it for the definitions. The, the change in 311, this is where VHCB is actually established. The, the strike on 17 and 18 is just a drafting thing. So we have next though, that's starting at the bottom of five, moving into six, it is the composition of the board itself. And you know, I wanna note, this is an error. This should be 12 uh, based on the proposal that you have. Um, and I'm sorry that we missed that. But right now, so the board has, uh, you know, this membership and the changes you'll see, we have Secretary of Agriculture, it proposes to remove the Secretary of Human Services, um, Secretary of ANR, the Executive Director of VHFA. The addition here in four, what would be four, would be to add two public members appointed by the Executive Director of Racial Equity with the advice and consent of the Senate, who are residents of this state and are representatives of non-white Vermonters or from the Native American Indian tribes recognized by the state pursuant to 1 VSA chapter 23. Um, this is composition of a board that does certain activities. This is not the kind of you know, uh, race-based benefit allocation that would be potentially problematic. So I don't, I think this is just a policy choice. Who are you putting on the board? Who do they represent? What does it reflect in its operations? So in five here, reduce, going down from three to two public members appointed by the governor, residents of the state, experience in affordable housing and conserving land uh, or recreational lands or in racial and social equity policy. So those are, those are ors there. So these two public members appointed by the governor um, are experienced in one or more of these things. It doesn't have to be all of them. Um, and you've got options. You've got affordable housing, ag forest land, historic properties, natural areas, rec lands, or uh, racial and social equity policy. So obviously those things are not necessarily going to all be represented by these two members. And even though you're adding in the possibility of experience in racial and social equity policy, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is the box that gets checked. And you'll see on lines 15 through 17, a little more specific here, one of the governor's appointees has to be a representative of lower income Vermonters and one has to be a farmer or a forester as defined. So slight change there. Um, in six, a public member, this would be appointed by the speaker. The new language would modify slightly to say, with ex expertise and professional experience in community planning and smart growth principles as defined in 24 VSA 2791. So that would make the house appointee um, not so much at large anymore, but a person with specific expertise and experience in community planning and smart growth. On page seven here, subdivision seven unchanged. This is the public member from the Senate. No, no comparable uh, modification there to the House member. Um, in subdivision eight, 
increasing from two to three public members that are jointly appointed by the speaker and the pro tem. Um, so A, just a drafting thing, substantive change in B. So one member from the nonprofit conservation organization whose activities are eligible under subdivision 303 of this title, who has expertise and professional experience in climate change, such as climate mitigation, climate resilience, or improvements in biodiversity is not an employee or member of the board of those organizations. So adding a little more shape to one of the joint members uh, requiring specific expertise and experience in climate change. So that's it for the board. And now in section four, the allocation system, here's where in statute we really are putting shape around how the board administers its funds, right? And um, you'll see existing law in A, when VHCB is allocating funds, it's supposed to give priority to projects that combine the dual goals of affordable housing and land conservation. Um, and it says, you'll see on the top of page eight, that the board shall also consider factors, not limited to these factors, but these, this is the list of the things the VHCB should think about when it's considering allocating its funding. So one, this need to maintain balance between the dual goals of housing and conservation. Two, timely response to unpredictable circumstances. Uh, three, level of funding by private or public sources in the activity. So are there financial partners, et cetera? Um, four, sustainability of the project in the future. Um, five, not displacing lower income Vermonters. Six, long-term effect of a proposal on affordable housing. Um, seven, the geographic distribution of funds. And then eight, this new piece would add expanding access to land and home ownership to Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination or unequal access to benefits and services, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So um, again, I, I'll pause here and say, this is the list of factors, and it's not exhaustive, but it is um, seven and would be eight things the board should consider when it's looking at how it's going to allocate its resources. Adding in number eight here would be one of those things it thinks about how can we expand, does this project expand access to land and home ownership for Vermonters who have suffered discrimination historically. And again, I this is not a mandate. This is not VHCB, you know, allocate 25% of your funds every year based on race. It's not that uh, construct. It's, this is one of many things to think about. And I think, you know, this is the kind of thing that is along the spectrum and probably not problematic from um, a constitutional perspective. Um, to give you, you know, sort of a, a check there. Um, the next piece on page nine. This is an entirely new section. Chair, could I could I ask David a question before we move on? Um, sure, David, you okay? Yeah, yeah, please. David, in in this this list of um, kind of principles for the allocation, um, eight is underlined. Is that the new? principle or do these other ones currently exist for VHCB and statute? That's right. All, uh, the one through seven uh, are all current law. They are unchanged, no strikes, okay. no underlines. And then eight, the underlying language is the proposal of a new factor. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Sure. Um, page nine. Section five, conservation easements and access. So uh, again, a new section of law, the board shall include an easements it obtains pursuant to chapter 155 of this title 
for projects that are owned by a nonprofit organization, a municipality, or the state of Vermont, and for other lands as the board finds appropriate, one or more provisions that allow for pedestrian access to the conserved land by members of Vermont recognized tribes to gather for non-commercial use, medicines, natural foods, and ceremonial natural materials, not including standing timber. So there's, there's quite a bit to unpack there. You'll, you know, the reference to chapter 155 of Title 10, that chapter deals with how the state obtains and manages easements to properties, and particularly when the state provides funding for the conservation of land. Um, so uh, whether that's through a partner like the land trust or the, or whether the, uh, the land uh, is funded, the, the acquisition or development of land is funded through VHCB dollars, and then the VHCB is a condition of its funding can uh, require an easement that has various, you know, uh, requirements attached to it, often negotiated by the parties, some of it governed by statute, but here the statute would actually say that the board shall include in those easements, if they're owned by nonprofits, municipalities, or the state, and possibly for other lands, which would probably you know, be privately held, that shall include uh, an access easement for these Vermont recognized tribes for these purposes. Um, so that's mandatory. You know, it's not a may include, it's a shall include. Um, in this context. The last section, section six, has to deal with VHCB's uh, annual report to the executive branch and to committees of jurisdiction in the legislature. Um, and it adds a, a new component of that annual report, subdivision five here, identification and evaluation of structural barriers that are contributing to racial, ethnic, and economic disparities in housing, home ownership, and access to publicly supported open spaces, actions the board is taking to remove these barriers and increase equity and access to board supported programs, and metrics to monitor progress in removing these disparities. So that's an annual, that would be part of the annual report from VHCB, again, to the executive and legislative branches. And this would all take effect on passage. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I'm just curious, I, I'm reading into it in that second line of this last bit, that that would include any of these easements that had been determined by the prior section. That would be something that had to be reported within that. Uh, you know, presumably it, it I, I guess it might, I don't, I don't know that it's required here. Um, I mean, this is structural barriers that are contributing to the problem and then what are we doing about it? So if, um, you know, to the extent they do obtain new easements that, and those easements do, uh, provide for access, I suppose that easement is a response to a structural barrier and would be included presumably, but it's not specific. So if it weren't included, it wouldn't be critiqued as being an error? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it's a matter of communication. And, and if, if this easement was be, being created for the purposes as stated, it would be important that they be public and known. So I just am concerned that there wouldn't be a tool that ensured that. But we're in a walkthrough, so I'm sorry. I think, I'm, I think before my chair tells me, I think I'm stepping beyond what we're trying to do here. It's hard to tamp down people's curiosity. Um, further questions for David right now? Representative Kalaki, or for conversation, doesn't have to be for David specifically. Um, Representative Kalaki. 
Well, it, I, I think I'm understanding the intent of it, but I'm interested how um, in the framing of this, people with disabilities are completely left out of this. And, I, and so it's, um, I, I, I guess we'll have to hear from the agency how they track who actually they've helped and who's been excluded or with that, because we have an econo economic issue, which is important. We have the BIPOC thing, which is important. And I just don't know if we look at who's been left out in our state systemically, if um, it, it, it can be this narrow cast to be appropriate. And so I, I guess it's not a question for you, David, it's a question for uh, 11 o'clock when they come in, we can talk about who is served by this agency and who's, who's missing for us to then look at kind of setting this framework up or I don't know, David, do you have any response to that or? Um, I don't because those are, you know, I think, I mean, it's a great question. I think it's a good one for VACB. I, I'll, I'll only comment that from, you know, from my side, working for you all, um, wanting to make sure you, you get uh, to where you want to go. I guess I would encourage everybody to whatever bills you pursue or policy language you pursue, I, I think it's important to be um, consistent in the terminology that you use. It's important to uh, be um, like intentional in the types of uh, benefits or services or information you want and for what basis and it, and when you think about communities that you want to help or identify or target or whatever it is that um, you know if there's a first of all use the same language for the same communities and then be again thoughtful and intentional about who it is that you want to be included or not so that you know if there are certain if there are some places in a bill where you just want certain benefits to flow one direction or to think about one population or not, uh, you know, from a drafting and policy perspective, it seems to me that you want to be very consistent about, uh, you know, using the same terms and, uh, and, and benefiting all of the same groups, unless there is a reason not to. You right. don't want to inadvertently have one population here and one population there and, and not really not really a reason for it other than just a fault of language. So right. That Thank would be you, my Dave. admonition. That, that's very helpful. Thanks. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. This is, I think, more appropriate for this level of what we're looking at. I would just ask if uh, David could maybe do a little bit of a uh, screen share and a uh, tutorial maybe on, on the the statute as it exists and where it would be affecting this. It was a little bit of a hiccup that we got caught on the floor with recently where we hadn't done that piece of homework. And I think that it could be helpful. Um, I, I tried to do the search on the one referenced with just that it was in this title and um, little, little hard to kind of discern a, a, a clear link. And I think that's something that can sometimes help us understand how we're changing what already exists. I don't think I, I don't think I follow what you're asking for. Um, well, it, at section five, the first sentence says, uh, pursuant to chapter 155 of this title. And so chapter 155 is, is pretty big. It, it has a lot of sections. And so just maybe as a committee, getting a quick run through of what that chapter is. So we'd see the link and, and maybe it's because I'm new to the committee and you all are just totally into it because you've been doing this piece of work. But just, just looking at the actual legislative existing language link could be helpful. And this one's a little more complicated than some are, but. Ah, yeah, actually, you, you, yeah. You're specifically asking about 10 VSA chapter 155 and what, what is included in that. That's the example I'm using. Yes, we often in these um, bills, as we look at them, are, well, we pretty much always are affecting standing language. And so if we could see what the standing language is, rather than just 
um, what we're doing to it when we cite a, a piece of our statute. And, and so this is my example of where we cite a piece of the statute. And if you could just give us a real quick little link to it or look at. Um, so do you, I, I, Chad, do you want me to not pull that right chapter up uh, so, on the screen right now or? So let me, let me, let me, but so Representative Murphy, what you're asking for is what is the existing statutory language that establishes this board for VHCB? No, no. And that's, I'm sorry, I'm being so confusing. It's, it's just, I'm thinking of a floor question that was asked on a totally different bill about whether we looked at the statute that was being cited. And we kind of all went, because as a committee, I'm not sure we could pull up meeting recording that showed us doing that. I think several of us have and, and did, but that's different from having a committee position on it. So I'm just thinking that when we reference as we do a walkthrough, um, the pieces of statute, whether we could have have a link to it. And I'm sorry that this one's so complicated that we I don't know that we want to spend the time on it right now looking down through that whole piece, but individually we certainly could. Um yeah let's 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 not go down that path quite yet. Um because I think we're gonna, you know, again when we hear from VHCB in general, I don't know if you know it's Let's just leave it a little bit higher altitude for right now, and um, but mark it because you know it, you're right. A detail is a detail, and so let's let's just mark it for reference. All right. Anything else right now for David? No, I think David, um, you know, what I'm, I appreciate you, the, the way that you opened this up. Um, Cause this, the, the, I have a feeling that we'll have a similar conversation as I, I think what your opening comments on this bill also apply to is H273 when we do a walkthrough of that bill as well, uh, because it's about crafting, because the, the opening um, findings that intent in that bill are much longer. There's a lot more history um, involved with that, but it does point out the, the um, as you mentioned, the fine line, but a fine line or a line between what we're able to do without um, some making something unconstitutional. And so the so the problem solving for us is how do you provide the services that the intent is you know, where the intent is clear, but does not um, become unconstitutional. So um, if I if I heard you correctly. Um, all right. Well, without any further questions for David, then committee, I think what we'll do is we'll take a break now till 11 and um, come back for VHCB.